Welcome back, online family, to yet another teaching. Uh, it's your boy JR yet again. And today's topic, or yeah, topic or teaching is Does Jesus' teachings permit div divorce? Does Jesus' teachings permit divorce? So uh, we're going to get right into this. And the first thing I want to do is define uh, what is divorce. So, divorce, I found I was able to find a Hebrew word, which is garish, and it means to drive out. Uh, in Greek, I was able to find a word called apalio, and it means to relieve re or to release. And uh, in, uh, in our English dictionary online, I was able to find uh, divorce means to basically breach or sever, you know, based on a written letter. So when you think about divorce in uh, the court of law, uh, it is a written document that basically severs the, the marriage between a man and women oh, and a woman. So now keeping that in, in consideration or in our minds now, understanding what divorce is in, 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 uh, in, in general, divorce is literally separation. You know, it is legal, legal separation. That's the best way I would define it. Because there's, like I said, with all those different definitions I gave you, I want to sum it up. And put it all together and say it like that. Divorce is legal separation. It's legal separation. So you think about when I say legal separation, uh, an example of when you say legal separation, I want to give an example in saying if I'm going 70 miles an hour in a speed limit zone that is 50 miles an hour, then it is le the cop has legal rights to give me a ticket because I have violated the law. So divorce is you having legal right to separate from your spouse. So the question now is, does Jesus' teachings permit that? Does Jesus' teachings permit me to legally divorce my wife? Does Jesus' teachings permit a woman to, to legally be able to separate from her husband? And uh, off the bat, I want to say the answer is yes. Um, but there's some exceptions. There's only one exception to the yes based on scripture, because everything I teach, I teach within the context of scripture and nothing more, nothing less. So we're going to start, you know, in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, you know, uh, the four Gospels touch on this topic and it is uh, Jesus speaking himself. So we will start first and foremost in Matthew chapter five, verses 32, Matthew Chapter 5, verse 32, uh, the Bible versions I'm reading from are the NLT, New Living Translation, and this Bible, which is a uh, New King James Version, New King James Version Bible. So I will read it in both versions, just so that way we can see how it's worded in both versions, and then we can see if they're both uh, saying the same thing. So starting with the NLT version, it says, you have heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. That's in the NLT. And the New King James Version, it is written as follows. It says, furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. So just in this first piece of scripture, you know, they both seem to be echoing the same thing. It's worded a little differently, but it's echoing the same exact thing. And Jesus gives an exception in, in the NKJV version, the, the NKJV, yeah, the New King James Version, the NKJV Version, uh, it says Yes, with the exception being sexual immorality. In the NLT version, it says yes, with the exception being the same thing, unfaithfulness. So the reality is, just in, just in this first piece of scripture that Jesus talks about this, he, he, he lays down uh, the foundation to be simply for uh, infidelity reasons. Because, you know, you have to recognize that when you and uh, your wife, if you're a husband watching this or a wife watching this, you and your husband, when you become one, you know, you're one in spirit. You guys share a spirit. You see, what does that mean when you share a spirit? That That's what binds you. How, what binds me to my brother and sister in Christ? It's the Holy Spirit. So what makes me one with my brother and sister in Christ? Again, I say it's the Holy Spirit. So you see those who give their life to Christ, and you'll find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when we give our life to Christ, we become one 
by the spirit. And the same thing follows when a man marries his wife, they become one in spirit. You know, a lot of times we use the phrase a soul tie, but there's no such thing. I want to correct that today. There is no such thing as a soul tie because your soul is you. We are made up of three, uh, the, the, the humans are made up of three parts. You have the, the body, which is the physical, this is you. You have the soul, which is who you are. It's your existence. Think about that as the seed. The seed is you. That's the soul. That's you. The existence of you is your soul. And we all started as a seed. So think about your soul as the you as a seed that has now grown to you, but that's your soul. And then you have a spirit. The spirit is breath. That's what, that's what enables you to be alive. We breathe because we have a spirit. You see, the Bible says God formed the man in Genesis chapter two, that man being Adam. He forms him from the dust of the ground. And after he formed him, so that means a man had a physical body, you know, but he wasn't alive yet until God breathed the breath of life, which is the spirit into him. And the Bible talks about the human spirit. You'll find that in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes. So the reality is we are made up of a body, physical body. We're made up of a soul, which is who you are. And you're made up of a spirit, which is breath and which is what enabled you to live. Now, when you get married, you don't share your soul because your soul is you. Again, it's like a seed. It's you. Your body is you. But what joins together with your wife is the spirit. The same way when I give my life to Jesus, what binds me to Christ, what binds me to my brother in Christ is the Holy Spirit. Think about it in the same form. When you give your, when you get married, you and your wife are now conjoined by the Spirit. Not, I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit, but I'm talking about eight, your spirit and her spirit, they unite. But now what happens is when you get involved in what you call infidelity or cheating or adultery, what happens is you are going to become one in spirit with whoever you're sleeping with. And to, to put some Bible on this, because I don't want to teach something that I can't prove to you with scripture. When you sleep with a woman who isn't your wife, now you have you're going to now become one in spirit with her. So to, to show you this in scripture in one Corinthians chapter six, starting at verses 15, it says, don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? He says, should a man take his body, which is part of Christ and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scripture says the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality, sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who, who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. So you're going to see again, you know, you become one in body, you know, with your wife. But again, as it gave more understanding, it's in a spiritual way because me and my wife's bodies are not conjoined. You don't see my wife glued to me. But what happens in the spirit is we're one. In the spiritual realm, we are conjoined. This is why those of you, if you're married, a lot of times when you have dreams, you see her with your wife or if you're you're married, you see you with your husband because in the spiritual realm, you guys are one. The same way in the spiritual realm, when the devil sees me, when demons see me, they see Jesus because we're one, we're conjoined, but we're not conjoined in the physical, we're conjoined in the spiritual. And so you and your wife are conjoined spiritually. But what happens now when you sleep with another woman, you are now conjoined with her. And that's why you, you it's so important to understand the spiritual spiritual aspect of a marriage, not just the physical aspect, because a lot of times we think that sleeping with someone is just a physical thing for physical pleasure and then it's done. No, something happens spiritually every time you sleep with somebody, something happens. And so if you are sleeping with someone that is not your spouse, spiritually, you are becoming, you have now become conjoined to someone other than your spouse. And that, my friend, is it gives a legal right for divorce based on the teachings of Christ because he taught that, that infidelity. He taught that unfaithfulness, you know, um, you know, sexual immorality. These are grounds for, for divorce. And, and, and um, like I said, that is the only reason, scripturally speaking, that Jesus ever gave for, um, for, for, for divorce. And I want to read one of the other things that one of the other um, pieces of scripture where Jesus talks about this, because I want to go a bit further with you today uh, about this particular topic to give more understanding based on the differences of Jesus's teachings on divorce and Moses's teachings on divorce. I want to give uh, some 
understanding about that. And so we're going to go to our next piece of scripture, which is in Matthew chapter 19. And we will read uh, starting at verses 1 up to verses 12. Matthew chapter 19, we will read at verses 1 all the way up to verses 12. And I will first read in the New King James Version. So that way, because like I said, sometimes uh, it's worded a little different in different Bibles, but it's good to kind of, you know, compare and contrast the two to see because sometimes the wording can give you more details based on the version you read. And But I do want you to know that no matter what version you read, they're usually going to always echo the same thing. So it's not a big deal if you say, well, my version is King James Version. My version is New Living Translation. Mine is NIV. The reality is as long as it's saying the same thing for the most part, that's all that matters. But different versions allow you to get different details. So I like to read two different versions, but those are the ones I read. New King James Version and the New Living Translation. And so in the New King James Version, this is what it says. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And I want you to pay attention to the wording of what they just said there. They asked Jesus, does the law at this time, which was the law of Moses, they're saying, does the law permit or is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason because the law of Moses permitted you to divorce your wife for any reason you could have said ah her feet got big divorce I'm done you could have said ah she gained a little bit too much weight I, I don't want to be with her divorce you could have said <clears throat> when I married her she had long hair but then I woke up in the morning and <laughs> the hair was gone come on fellas you know it'd be like that sometimes come on we ain't joking we just we, we just we ain't just joking but let me chill. The point is, you say, last night when we got married, she had hair. This morning, there was no hair. What's going on? I want a refund. I want a divorce. You could say that, right? In the Old Testament, lawful. No matter what the reason was in the Old Testament, you had the, the law permitted it. You could have just wrote a, law, a, a divorce slip and gave it to your wife and said, we're no longer married. Bye. And the reason could have been something as simple as, this last night she had weave in this morning she took it out and you don't like that the reason could be he was you know maybe 180 pounds when you married him and then maybe two years go by he's been eating too much because your cooking is so good and now he's 250 pounds he has a double chin he has no neck and you can't see his ankles anymore and now you say i don't want to be with him anymore so so, so in the old testament in the law of moses back before the holy spirit lived in man this is how divorce was. So they asked Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Pay attention to that context, just any reason. And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them, speaking of God the Father, he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they, so then, so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And so I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His, his disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. So there's a lot to touch on this. There's a lot. So the first thing I want to touch on, like I said before, is they ask, is it lawful for just any reason to divorce your wife? Because in the law of Moses, as I said, you could have divorced your right. You could have divorced your wife for any reason. It was lawful. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus is giving context. He's saying from the beginning, God made the male and female. And he said, this is why a man leaves his father and joins his, and joins his, um, his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. And what makes them one flesh is the spirit, as I explained before. So then uh, he goes on to, Jesus goes on to say, so they're no longer two, but one. But there's a couple of things that he, there's something he's going to say here that I'm going to really begin to touch on to give understanding to somebody. He says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And when he says man, you know, uh, he's talking about um, not just 
man in terms of a male he's talking about humans when because the context of how he's saying man let no man separate you have to remember that a woman is a woo man a man is a man but in the context that he's saying man he's talking about a human not, meaning let no human uh separate them because like i said a man the man himself like if i'm the married man to my wife that includes me but this also includes my wife so my point is what he says therefore what god has joined together let no man separate I want first and foremost to touch on it from the male perspective, again, from the husband perspective. You're involved in let no man separate it because as a husband, I don't have the right to separate myself from my wife after God joined us together. I don't have that right anymore because like I said, in the Old Testament, the law of Moses permitted me to leave my wife for any reason. But now in Jesus' teaching, he's saying, let no man separate what God has joined together. And the reality is if a lot of you are, are, are married watching this and you're Christian and you're the way you and your husband or the way you and your wife came together was or it was led by God. That means you you can see that the person you're with, it was almost like God aligned it to happen. He, he ordained that thing to happen based on certain things that happened that brought you guys together. That means you can clearly see that your marriage is divine. Your marriage was led and it was chosen. This person was chosen for you by God. That that means now you can't try to separate yourself from this individual without biblical reason in the New Testament. And so Jesus is saying, let no man separate. And this is why one of the things I wanted to talk about with this, he's going to say it and I'm going to touch on it. He says, because they're going to ask him, then why did Moses' law basically command that you can give your wife a certificate of divorce and put her away? Jesus is again, he's going to give a detail that's very important. He says, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. So now you have to remember, he says from the beginning, it was not so. So you have to see what is Jesus talking about from the beginning, it was not so. He's talking about Adam and Eve. In the beginning, divorce wasn't a thing. Why? Because sin had not yet entered. So because sin had not yet entered, the man and the woman, they were flourishing in the Garden of Eden. There's no problems. There's no sin. Because you have to remember that sin is what brings death. Sin is what brings all these problems. Sin is what makes, you know, your life sometimes feel like a living hell. Sin does that. But remember, before sin entered in, perfect, there was perfection. So the man is living in unity with his wife. Everything is going good. That's why he says it it wasn't like that from the beginning, but Moses permitted it when the hearts got hard. When did the hearts get hard? Ha, ah, my goodness, we're going to talk about it. The hearts got hard when sin came in because it's sin that makes your heart hard. You see, sin is what blinds you first and foremost. So when you're blinded, you don't accept the ways of God. And by not, by not accepting the ways of God, your heart's going to become hard like stone. Example, Pharaoh. You're going to see God harden his heart. And every time God would send Moses to say something to Pharaoh, he doesn't listen. And then through not listening, his heart just remains hard. It remains hard, I mean. It remains hard. His heart remains hard. So the reality is Jesus is saying Moses permitted the divorce. He's giving them understanding now because the hearts were hard. So Moses did it in a way to basically work with the individual because your heart is heart. And so this is what is going to be best. This is what makes the most sense. Rather than telling this guy maybe stone his wife to death to leave so that they can be separated. This is like the safest way because your heart is hard. And, and someone whose heart is heart, it's hard to deal with. It's hard to work with something like that. So he's like, what's best is just write her a divorce, slip, send her on away. But why now Jesus emphasizes the hard thing is because in the New Testament, when you receive the Holy Spirit, your heart is no longer hard. And there's a prophecy that God gave in the book of Ezekiel. I want to read it. And he talked about this. You know, it's a prophecy talking about how he would give, you know, the people of Israel a new heart. And he says this in Ezekiel. I want to read this chapter 11, starting at verses 14. It says, then this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, the people still left in Jerusalem are talking about you and your relatives and all the people of Israel who are in exile. They are saying those people are far away from the Lord. So now he has so now he has given their land to us. Therefore, tell the exiles. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Although I have scattered you in the countries of the world, I will be a sanctuary to you during your time in exile. I, the sovereign Lord, will gather you back from the nations where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel once again. When the people return to their homeland, they will remove every trace of their vile images and detestable idols, and I will give them singleness of heart and put a new spirit within them. 
I will take away their stony, stubborn heart and give them a tender, responsive heart so they will obey my decrees and regulations. Then they will truly be my people and I will be their God. So you begin to see that in this prophecy, he's talking about obviously when the people would return back from exile, the people of God. But one thing he emphasizes is that he would give them a new heart, which is something we also receive because when we give our life to Jesus, you know, we receive the spirit of God. And when the spirit of God comes within us, everything that is out of order becomes in order. Everything that is, you know, not clean becomes clean. Everything that is not of God becomes of God because his spirit is in us. And having a hard heart is sin that causes that when the spirit of God comes in, I receive a new heart, a tender heart, a responsive heart, a heart that is in alignment with the heart of God. And so with that being said, now Jesus is teaching, you have to, you have to align what I just said with why he's talking about the heart thing. Moses permits divorce because your heart was hard. Meaning you were divorcing your wife for reasons that had nothing to do with sexual immorality. You see, a hard heart makes you do that. A hard heart makes you say, my husband gained 300 pounds and I don't want to be with him no more because he's ugly. A hard heart makes you say, my wife can't cook. And, you know, in the beginning of the marriage, I was cool with eating out. But now two years in, I don't want to eat out anymore. A hard heart makes you say, I'm going to just replace her and get, you know, a woman that could cook. A hard heart makes you say, man, he lost his job and now this last year has been rough. So I, I need a man who's making a lot of money so I can continue to live lavish. A hard heart makes you say, because that he, because he's not making as much money anymore, I'm leaving. A hard heart does that. A hard heart makes you say, well, you know, I, I was cool with her wearing weave in the beginning, but now I just want a girl who, who has natural long hair. So, so I'm leaving. A hard heart does that. A hard heart makes you say, uh, this guy, um, yeah, he can cook. Yeah, he, he cleans, but but he's just not manly enough for me. You know, in the beginning, I was cool with the guy that I can kind of run on and he's going to let me do what I want. But but now I kind of want a man who's more aggressive, a man who's more manly. So so a hard heart makes you say, yeah, I'm done with this guy. He's kind of wimpy. You see, a hard heart makes you think of yourself. A hard heart makes you release yourself from a marriage without it even being for infidelity reasons. That's what a hard heart does. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Moses' law permitted that because that was the kind of heart people had. But when you come to God, my God, you recognize that if it isn't infidelity reasons, I have to learn to, to, to adjust. I have to learn to work. You see, the heart of God is patient. The heart of God, you know, it, it, it is kind. It is gentle. The heart of God, you know, recognizes that it's not always going to be about me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, not for him, but for me. So you see the thing about when you receive God's heart, you love differently. When you receive God's heart, you're not as selfish the way they were in the Old Testament when they had hard heart. So now this is why Jesus is saying that it is not lawful. It, it was lawful back then because of the hard hearts. But now now, because we're going to receive a new heart, this is why he's saying that that's not the way of God from the beginning. Because in the, in the beginning, Adam didn't have a hard heart, nor did Eve, because sin had not yet entered into the world. And so when sin had not yet entered into the world, we see without a hard heart, unity was there. And so he goes on to tell them, again, it was because of the hard heart that, that Moses permitted it. But he says it wasn't like that from the beginning. And so he goes on to say, and so... I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, again, he says it, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her, uh, marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. So you have to see the context is if you divorce your husband or if you divorce your wife and the reason was not because of cheating, it was not because of sexual immorality uh, or infidelity, then you are now violating a biblical law or a biblical command, which is you, you don't have a right to divorce for any reason. Jer, what if my husband is beating me? It's a great question. If your husband is beating you, my advice to you is get away. My advice for you is, you know, definitely get away, uh, get help for him and for you uh, and pray for him. But you can't divorce him because the Bible doesn't say if your husband's beating you, you get to divorce him. And the reality is if, a, if your husband is beating you, to me, that is proof that there is a demonic spirit in him. Because there's the, the, the reality is the spirit of God is not going to make a man beat his woman. It's just not going to happen. That is grounds that he has a demon in him. Because everything that is unnatural, everything that is 
contradictive of the, the word of God. There's a spirit behind that. And so I always say the same way you say someone is stealing, the same way someone is always lying. Jesus said to the people that were lying, he said, you're, 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 you're children of your father, the devil. So the reality is there's a spirit that makes man or woman do things they shouldn't do, do things that are contrary to God's word. So I say again, if this man is beating you, there is a demon in him. And you, yeah, you need to get far from him first and foremost. But then secondly, you need to pray for him. That's what you need to do. You need to pray for him. But divorcing him is not something you have legal ground to do. There's a spirit in that man. You're going to see in the book of Acts chapter 19, uh, seven sons of Sceva go to a house of a man who's demon possessed. And they try to cast out the demon. They, they, they say in the name of Jesus, whom Paul serves, you know, and, 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 and uh, we command you to come out. The demon says to this guy, the demon speaking through this man's mouth says to them, Paul, I know Jesus, I know who are you? And then the Bible says the demon beat these guys naked until they left the house running naked. But you see, it, under the demon's power, it talks about it. he beat them up. So again, when you talk about this idea of, of of putting your hands on people, you talk about, you know, beating people or your wife. To me, that is grounds that there is a demon in you because that is not of God. The spirit of God is tender. It is nice. It is loving. And 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 to, to beat someone without reason or to beat a woman, that's not of God. So my biblical opinion about a man who does that is he's demon possessed and he needs prayer. But to get back to point, you still can't divorce him because that is not one of the grounds Jesus gave. Uh, the only ground he gave was sexual immorality. And I explain why that one is the one that he gave is because when a man sleeps with a woman that isn't his wife, he now becomes one in spirit with her. Yeah, he's one with her now. And so he severed what we had. Vice versa, if a woman cheats on her husband and sleeps with another man, you now have severed what y'all had. You did that. That action has now made you one with someone else. Spiritually, you become one with someone else. So the reality is that is legal grounds for he to leave you or for you to leave him. And and but that's the only ground. Okay, JR, what if he doesn't work and he's broke as a joke and he's just not paying bills around here? Sorry, honey, you should have thought about that before you married him. You should have read the car facts. You know, you bought the car because it looked nice. It looked real shiny. My goodness, it was going to be look. You was going to be able to flex on the gram real good with this car. But you didn't read the car facts and then you pull it out a lot. And then a month down the line, it has all these problems. Right? You should have read the car facts. It's the same thing. This guy on Instagram had so many followers. He looked like a stand up gentleman, you know, 6'3", 200 pounds of solid muscle. Man, he looked the part. But then you married him and then but but you didn't really read into his life. You didn't really get to know him. You just saw what you saw on the surface. But then now you married him and then you realize he doesn't clean. You realize he doesn't work. You realize he doesn't give you massages the way you thought he would. And then he's just basically not the guy you thought he was based on his profile pictures. Well, guess what? Now you're stuck with him. You don't get to divorce him because he doesn't cook. You don't get to divorce him because he doesn't clean. You don't get to divorce him because he brings in zero dollars a week. You don't. You have to deal with it. And now my best advice is you better start praying that God changes him. But if you divorce that man and go marry someone else, you are committing adultery, which there is great punishment for that. Because the Bible says someone who commits adultery, first and foremost, won't get into heaven. That's what the first thing. But now let's say you give your life to Christ, you change, and now you're saved. Okay, I believe you will go to heaven, even though you committed adultery. I believe you will go to heaven, but I do believe you're going to be disciplined because now you're a child of God. So it's either you commit adultery and you're not saved and you go to hell, or you commit adultery and you are saved and you get disciplined because Hebrews chapter 12 says God disciplines his children. So if you do commit adultery as a child of God, I'm telling you, you will go to heaven, but you're going to be disciplined on earth before you die. And it is going to be painful. So I would advise you, sometimes they say the grass isn't greener on the other side. If you've already put yourself in a situation with an individual who you don't really like and you don't like his or her ways, deal with it. Because if you breach that marriage and go marry someone else that's adultery and believe me it will not the grass will not be greener on the other side it will not be i can guarantee you that so those are the things that we see here divorce was permitted in the old testament and the law of moses because they had a hard heart they received a new heart by god when you give your life to christ and receive the holy spirit so now you don't have a reason the divorce. And I want to talk to the men around here that are watching this word, married or not yet married. I want to read something in the book of Proverbs because, uh, again, 
when Jesus said again, he says, let no man separate what God has joined together. That involves uh, the husband because sometimes a lot of marriages are broken or they end up becoming, you know, uh, broken because of the husband cheating. That's something we see a lot, a lot. And this is why you're going to see the disciples even before I get there. In Matthew 19, where we just were, his disciples said to him, if such is the case, of the man with his wife, it's better not to marry because basically the disciples are like, wait, like, so you're basically telling me if it's just for sexual immorality reason, I can't get a divorce. They're saying it's, it's probably better for us not to marry because the context of how I read they're saying that is, it's going to be difficult because now you're telling me I can't get a divorce for every little reason, one. And then two, for sexual immorality reasons, that's the reason I can get a divorce only. So they're saying it's probably better to not marry. And, and the reason, like I said, again, is because one being some men think I can leave for any reason as well. But two, some men, they have a cheating problem. And so they're saying it might be better to just not marry them because if I kept marrying, I just start cheating. Then basically I'm going to screw up a marriage and then the next marriage, the next marriage. So it's probably better to not marry. And Jesus says, yeah, maybe, you know, he says some have become eunuchs, you know, because of that. My point in saying that is for the men. Uh, something I wanted to read is in Proverbs because it's something that can help the man, you know, and before I read what's in Proverbs, I want to read what's in Hosea chapter four, verse six, where, you know, the word of God is talking about how God's people were being, they were perishing because of a lack of knowledge. So uh, a lack of knowledge, that's again, Hosea four, six, uh, God was talking about his people being destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. When you become a husband, you need to have knowledge of God's word because the reality is God created marriage. The devil did not create marriage. If you go into the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis, you're going to see that marriage Marriage was something that God created, which means if God created marriage, the manual book of how to be in marriage, the manual book of the role of a man in marriage, the manual book for a woman in marriage, it is not in these books all over the world. It's in the Bible. It's in, but not just the Bible. It more so is going to come through your relationship with God, because if God is the one who created the woman, if God is the one who created marriage, for me to understand my role in marriage, for me to understand my wife, I need to go to the manual and the manual is in the hand of the creator. His name is God and his name is Yahweh. And so the reality is some men who are watching this, my advice to you is you need to get in a relationship with God or you are going to mess up your marriage. And nine times out of 10, it's typically through cheating. And so I want to read something in the book of Proverbs because this is from Solomon, the, the wisest man after Jesus who ever lived. And, and, and this is him in his own words. And we're going to find this in Proverbs chapter five. And I'm connecting what he wrote with what Jesus said when he says, let no man separate what God has joined together. I want to read something that um, Solomon says to the men in Proverbs chapter five and the wisdom that God gave him. He wrote, starting at verses 21, for the Lord sees clearly what a man does, examining every path he takes. An evil man is held captive by his own sins. They are ropes that catch and hold him. He will die for lack of self-control. He will be lost because of his great foolishness. Self-control is a fruit of the spirit that we men who are married must have because a lack of self-control will cause you to give in to your, your, your fleshly desires. And a lot of times as a married man, your flesh wants to sleep with another woman. Your flesh says, I've been with this woman for too long and I want to sleep with another woman. Well, you need to conquer that. You And the only way to do it is to grow in your understanding of what marriage is about. Marriage is not about you having sex five days a week. Marriage is about you building, you know, uh, whatever God has called you to build here on earth. Marriage is about you becoming one with this other woman and you guys, you know, leading and dominating in the area on earth that God has called you to dominate. And that might be business. That might be, you know, in, in the, the division of ministry in terms of music ministry. It might be in the in the realm of, uh, you say, maybe social media, but God has instituted every marriage on earth to dominate and express him in some way, shape or form. That's what marriage is about. It's a way for God to be glorified. Marriage is man and woman representing God. God together and expressing whatever and, and, and allowing God to be visible in whatever it is they do. You see that couple, they sing together and you say, man, the way they produce worship songs is beautiful. You see this couple, they do a business where they have, they, they make food and you say, man, the way this couple, they, they have this business is beautiful. You see marriage is a way for God to get glory because it's, it's, it's man and woman coming together to, to, to allow God's light to be shown through their marriage. And 
even further, the, through the man and the woman being what God has called them to be and living together in harmony, their children are able to grow up in a godly home and now become godly. This is what marriage is about. But marriage is not just about six, five times a week and your wife becoming some house slave. That's not what marriage is about. Your wife's job is not to be a house slave and give you sex five days a week. And so the problem is a lot of times that's the perspective of man because he's still a boy at mind. He's a, he's a man on the surface, but he's a boy at mind. He's a boy spiritually. And when you're a boy spiritually and you get married, the problem is you're going to probably cheat because your perspective on marriage is already wrong. If your perspective on marriage is already wrong, the chances of you screwing up your marriage are probably very high, probably very high. And so this is why Jesus talks about it in the Bible. You know, his word talks about it in Hosea 4, 6. My people are perishing because of a lack of knowledge. Brothers who are married, who are watching this, you got to get in a relationship with God. I can't stress that enough. You got to get in an active relationship with God because without it, you're going to destroy your marriage and it's probably going to be through infidelity. And the sad part is Jesus is giving ground that infidelity is a reason for divorce. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus is teaching. Say, now I know there are certain men of God that say, no, brother Jerry, you're wrong. Divorce is wrong. The Bible doesn't endorse it. No, 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 no. This is Jesus's teachings. And, I, and there's more. Mark chapter 10, he alliterates the same thing. So, so, so I don't care what pastor so-and-so says. I'm telling you what Jesus is teaching. And, and, and Jesus's teachings are, are final authority. And anyone who wants to debate it, I'm not up for the debate. Go debate it with God. But I'm giving you Bible. So we're going to go again before I continue my point. Mark chapter 10, verses 2 to 12. Jesus says, it goes on to say, some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? Yet again, Jesus answered them with a question. What did Moses, what did Moses say in the law about divorce? Well, he permitted it, they replied. He said a man can divorce his wife. Uh, he, he said a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. But Jesus responded, he wrote this commandment only as a concession to your hard hearts, as I said before, and as it said in the other scripture. But God made the male and female from the beginning of creation. This explained why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two, but one, let no one, you see, because I had told you last time that when he said, let no man, it was speaking of human, but this time it gives more understanding. It's worded a little different. It says, let no one, meaning no let no man or woman split apart where God is joined together. Later, when he was alone with his disciples in the house, they brought up the subject again. He told them, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries someone else, she commits adultery. So again, I said to you again, divorce, Jesus' teachings, the only way it is permitted in the New testament and the teachings of christ that differentiate from the teachings of how moses gave it is based on the heart thing which is in the new testament if you have a the holy spirit you have the, the heart of god infidelity will be the only reason you leave your spouse but men i'm telling you a lot of homes are being broken because the the husband is not in his bible the husband is not in an active relationship with god i'm going to give someone advice who's not married and you're a male watching this video if you don't have an active relationship with God, do us all a service. Do the society, do society a service. Don't get married yet. I'm say, I'm very serious about that. If you're a man watching this video and a woman watching this video and you are not yet married, if you can truthfully look in the mirror and say, I don't have an active relationship with God. I don't read my Bible. I don't pray. I don't talk to God. I, I just have a non-existent relationship with God. Like our relationship is probably like maybe a, a 5%. Don't get married yet. Because if you do, you don't have the knowledge and the relationship with God that you need to have a successful marriage. And so if you get in a marriage prematurely and you don't have maturity, you're going to destroy it. And a lot of times, like I said, from a male talking to another male, a lot of times it's, per, it's, it's, it's infidelity. It's infidelity. You know, a lot of times it is infidelity, you know, and um, that is a reason why I say what I'm saying, because a lot of marriages are being destroyed because of infidelity. And, and, and sadly, the Bible in Jesus' teachings permits divorce for infidelity reasons only. So we need to be better. I said to you again, uh, we... Moses' laws of divorce permitted you to get divorced for any reason, but in Jesus' teaching, he narrows it down to one reason, and it's infidelity. And that's what difference, you know, the divorce thing um, is, is, is one reason Jesus gave. Moses didn't really give any, just divorce if you want, and that was it. So does Jesus' teachings permit divorce? They do. And I want to touch on a couple more scriptures that are in scripture that, you know, you might have questions about. 
and then we'll wrap up this video. So we're going to go again. Uh, another scripture is Luke chapter 16, verses 18. It says, for example, a man who divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery. And anyone who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. So now what does that mean? It says, if, so basically, if a man divorces his wife and marries someone else, um, if a man divorces his wife and marries someone else, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm getting tongue tied. For example, a man who a man who divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery. So what does that mean? Again, if you if I'm married because I'm married right, I am a married man. So now, as a married man, if I were to say I'm leaving my wife, she didn't do anything wrong. Maybe I just say, you know, um, I just I want to be with a white girl now because my wife is is chocolate. She's caramel. But let's just say I said, I want to be with a white girl now. Nothing that my wife did wrong, but I just, I want to be with someone of a different color. Now, if I leave my wife for that reason and go and marry this, this white girl, then that is the adultery. That's adultery. And that white girl who marries me is also committing adultery. Now, one thing I want you to understand again, and it goes the same way, because I'm going to touch on it in the other part as well. If... I commit adultery and I am a man of God because I'm a child of God. I will be disciplined by God because Hebrews chapter 12. I want to read this for the viewer because I have to teach. I have to teach on this particular topic in great detail. So we have great understanding of this topic when we're done with this video. Um, so in Hebrews chapter 12, because I do want to touch on this, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verses seven. It says, well, starting at verses six, for the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember what God, that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who was never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you, you, if God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? So the reality is God disciplines his children. So I said to you now, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you know, talking verses 9 to 11, talks about how those who commit adultery will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then Hebrews 12 says God disciplines his children. <clears throat> so now we have to look at that in two, in two different uh, spectrums and say, okay, if the non-believer is committing adultery without repentance, without giving their life to Christ, and they die like that, then they're not going to go to heaven. That's Bible. But JR, what if a believer, okay, like I said, what if I did that? Do I lose salvation? Do I not go to heaven? No, that's not what happens. But what happens is you get disciplined. There is great discipline when you are a child of God and you are not in alignment with what God's teachings tell you to do. And the best example I can give you of that is the people of Israel. When you look at the people of Israel, they were children of God. Look at the Old Testament and it'll give you understanding of what discipline looks like. The people, the children of Israel in the Old Testament, whenever they turned away from what God told them to do, he would allow their enemies to overtake them. He would allow their enemies to dominate over them. He would all their enemies to basically take them in captivity, even though they were still his children. And it's the same thing today. If you and me start doing things that, the, that, the, that God's teachings tell us not to do, you're still his child. He still loves you, but he's going to let the enemy, that being the devil, put hands on you and, and it's not going to feel good. So the reality is I would tell someone watching this video who's thinking of divorcing their husband or thinking of divorcing your wife without the reason being infidelity, be careful. Because if you do that, now you're committing adultery. And if you're a child of God, you're going to be disciplined. And don't forget, the grass is not always greener on the other side. So, again, this is, uh, I want to touch on one more verse that talks about this, which is uh, what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And then I will wrap up this video because those are the verses that I know talk about this. So I want to touch on it. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10, Paul writes, But for those who are married, I have a command that comes not from me, but from the Lord. A wife must not leave her husband. But if she does leave him, let her remain single or else be reconciled to him. And the husband must not leave his wife. So now you say his command is saying a wife must not leave her husband. But if she does leave him, let her remain single or be reconciled to him. And that is why, I mean, that is the reason he's saying this is because he's the context of what Paul is, the context of what Paul is saying is a woman who left her husband without it being infidelity. That's why he says, if she does leave him, 
she has to remain single or else be reconciled to him. Because, like I said, what Paul writes can't contradict what Jesus said. It can't. The teachings, you have to make them, you know, synchronized. You have to make them the, the two teachings marry because I always say the Bible will not contradict itself. God will not contradict himself. So whenever someone tries to take a Bible verse and say, oh, no, look, this Bible verse is contradicting this one. No, it can't. That, that can't happen because God is the one who inspires the scriptures. He's the he's the inspiration behind the writer. So God's not going to inspire Paul to write something that contradicts what Jesus said. So that means you have to now look at both of the, the different uh, teachings and say, how do these two marry? And based on what Paul's saying, we get understanding based on what Jesus said, because he's getting this from what Jesus already said. And Jesus had already said it. Unless there's infidelity, unless there's unfaithfulness, you can't get a divorce. So the context of what Paul's saying is, because he, you have to remember, he's talking to the people of Corinth. For those of you who are Bible readers, you know that in Corinth, there was so much sin going on in Corinth. If anything, if there's a bigger, if there's a book that Paul's teachings really were like at a rebuke and touching on every kind of sin, it's really the book of Corinth because there was so much sin going on in the church of Corinth. So, so Paul is literally touching, yeah, we're probably going to get most of Paul's, you know, uh, teachings in the book of Corinth because he has two books uh, and one Corinthians to Corinthians, and you're going to see they're jam-packed with so much rebukes. They're jam-packed with so much teaching on sexual sin. So my point is you got to keep that in consideration as well. And so Paul is talking about, again, if you leave, you got to remain single or else go back. Because if you're leaving and you didn't leave with the reason being, you know, infidelity, he's saying you got to remain single or else go back. Yeah, he that guy doesn't cook, he doesn't clean, he he's a pig, you know, in terms of how he lives. He he's mean. I I feel you. But if you leave him, you gotta stay single. Or else I said to you, God disciplines his children. So you we have to live in the fear of the Lord, people. Like I said, sometimes you make decisions prematurely, but guess what? You gotta live with it. You gotta live with it. That is life. That's life. You make premature decisions got to live with it. They say in America, you make the bed, you got to sleep in it. You did not do your homework on this gentleman. And now you want to leave him because, you know, when he takes his shoes off, his feet stink. You got to deal with it because based on what Paul's teaching is saying, it's, it's synchronized with what Jesus said. If you leave, you got to remain single or else go back. But if you don't do what this is teaching, I said to you again, I, I will never teach that a, a child of God can lose their salvation because I just don't believe that. I don't believe when you become a child, you can become no longer a child. I don't believe that. So if you're a child of God committing adultery, meaning you left your spouse for, that, for reasons that were not sexual immorality and you marry someone else, you will be disciplined. And I'm telling you, discipline sometimes mean you can have, you know, a, a, a lose a leg. Discipline can sometimes mean the person you marry is even is double worse than the one you were with. Discipline can look any kind of way. And I just don't want to fall into the hand of God. So for you who's watching this, you ought to have the same mentality that I'm having right now, which is you don't want to fall into the hand of God. Because Jesus says, if you fall into the hand of God, who's going to rescue you? Can't nobody save you. So, so my advice to you, whoever's watching this, does Jesus' teaching permit divorce to conclude? They do. Only in the sense of infidelity. That's the only exception I saw Jesus gave. But if it's not for infidelity reasons, and like what Paul's saying, maybe you say, I'm going to leave for a little bit. And leaving not to go be with someone else, but maybe I'm going to leave and go back and live with my parents for a year or two and pray for this guy because he's beating me or maybe we're, we're arguing and it's getting out of hand. And maybe you say, I'm going to leave as Paul's saying, OK, if you leave, but stay single, don't go. You don't get to you don't get to leave and go mangle. <laughs> you got to leave and stay single. And then at the proper time, maybe this guy changes. You've been praying for him. You put his name in the church to pray for him. And maybe he changes and y'all reconcile. But I'm telling you again. And I conclude with, if you get a divorce for any other reason than what Jesus said, which was infidelity, and you're a child of God, you will be disciplined. And if you're not a child of God and you don't repent and you're in adultery, you're going to go to hell. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 11. That's what I conclude with in this teaching. So yes, Jesus' teachings permit divorce only under one exception. May God bless you.